Hello, and welcome to this week's message from Dr. David Mabry, lead pastor of Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. We're glad you're with us today. If you'd like more information about Orange Friends Church, visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. We're going to look at a, a passage today that is a common passage for uh, for for Mother's Day. Uh, but first, before I dive into that, I, I'm going to unapologetically um, uh, share something very, very direct, and I, have, I guess I have the privilege to do this, all right? And that is, um, you know, the front of books, there's like a dedication, this is dedicated to so-and-so, and the book may not have any connection necessarily to that person, just to say that it's dedicated to... Um, that person, and you may think, because it's Mother's Day, you may think, oh, isn't this going to be sweet? I know exactly who he's going to dedicate it to. And, but I'm going to surprise you a little bit. Um, and, that, and I'm not making an announcement by this, because it is Mother's Day. Uh, but you'll understand after I say this. But um, uh, I, today's sermon, and I've never done this before, but today uh, I'm going to very intentionally uh, do this. Today's sermon is actually dedicated to my daughter, Taylor. And... Um, uh, for very good reason. This is not to embarrass her, and she doesn't care anyhow in the long run because uh, she's going to Cleveland for the summer, and she won't be here for the summer. Um, and very intentionally, she's not going to be a mother, so that is not an announcement. Not, <laughs> not an immediate mother, but this is dedicated to Taylor, and she's going to be in the stead of all of our daughters who may or may not become mothers one day, but it's for those, those women and for those young women who will grow up it, 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 more and more each day. So there's the reason why this is for Taylor today. And you understand, at the end of this sermon, hopefully you connect with it. And if you don't, it doesn't matter to me because this is a very personal thing today in preaching from this passage that is dedicated, this sermon is dedicated to my daughter, Taylor, whom I love very, very much, and I'm very proud of her. Proverbs 31, uh, this section, like 10 to the end of the chapter, is probably the most famous and most preached about on Mother's Day. It is low-hanging fruit for sermon uh, fodder for a Mother's Day, right? You just, as a pastor, you're like, go to the easiest passage to preach on for a day that's dedicated to mothers, right? And so you go to that, that passage. But today we may have a slight uh, shift on things, and, but th- here's the thing. Even though it is like the major passage for Mother's Day, it does not mean that um, it should be avoided in the same way we should not avoid the birth accounts of Christ during Christmas because it happens every year. Or Easter time, we should avoid preaching on the passages that have to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because it's like, well, this happens every year and I just need fresh material. That's silly. So I say, let's go back to this, this well because these are deep waters and these are important waters. These are vital waters. These are living waters that we're turning to today. So with great intention intentionality, we turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 paints a model, an ideal of what a woman should be, a woman who fears the Lord as we opened up service. Now, it's a, it's a model. It is, it is an ideal, but as a model and an ideal, you may not necessarily achieve this fully but that doesn't mean we throw out all models and ideals because we're like well that's unattainable 
and too far out there, so I'm just going to stay with my imperfect self. I didn't want to come to church and feel guilty for what I am not today. No. Today, my heart in this passage is to encourage you to be the woman that God has called you to be. Men, you get, a, you get to sit in and listen, but you do not have a free pass this day. Pastors go through a challenge, by the way, on Mother's Day. As the prayer that we heard read, very beautiful prayer, um, every year I hear the same thing. Well, you talk to mothers, but what about those that are not mothers? And I say this, every last one of us are blessed by a sermon that is directed to mothers. We're all related to one. Every last one of us. Right? A couple of you got that. A couple of you are still hung up on something else I said earlier. Why Taylor? Hmm. <laughs> this passage, though, men... This is, you're welcome for me preaching this today to the women that are in your life. And men, you need to know this information just as valuable, maybe more valuable than it is for the women that will hear it today. So you don't check out on me now, brothers. Come on, hang with me, men, because this is for you as well. Now, that being said, this paints, let me complete my thought. This paints a model and an ideal of strength, might, and power. Of strength, might, and power. Not as the world may understand it, but as from a biblical standpoint, as God sees it. Strength is not adopting a traditional or cultural habits, uh, cultural habits and behaviors of oppression and dominance. Strength is rather controlled might or meekness as modeled by Jesus, used to serve others. Wealth, power, strength, position, authority are tools for service, avenues for justice, and opportunities for love. A godly woman is called to a place of strength, not a place of weakness. As a woman who is a disciple of Jesus, you are called to be Christ-centered and Holy Spirit-dependent in strength and power. That is our sermon today. Every last one of you, hear me clearly. What we see painted here is about a woman of excellence, but better said is a woman of valor. Now, I'm going to look at something. So I, don't, 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 I don't want to lose you. Those that aren't interested in, in the original language and the background of a passage, you just, just give me the straight stuff. Stay, stay in the shallows, Pastor, because it's, it's easier for me to digest. Let's go to the depths a little bit today. Let's go to the little depths today. That's your sermon today, painting a model and an ideal of feminine strength, might, and power. And, and then this is the case for it in verse 10. In verse 10, it says, um, in the original word there, there's a word there for excellence. That is not the best word to use for this, this verse. The best word to use instead of excellence is a woman of valor. A woman of valor who can find, for her price is far above rubies. And so you see in your notes in front of you some some things that we pull from this, the very first point, military might, it helps define and, um, and specify what this passage is really about and what the direction, because it starts with verse 10 here, and it sets up the entire passage going for, through verse 31. Verse 10, that first statement, the question that's asked at the very beginning sets up the entire thing, the rest of the poem that's here. And the poem is set up in like an alphabetical poem. We don't get this in English, but in Hebrew, the original language that it's written in, it's, in, it's, it's very creative in how it's written. 
It's written in like alphabetical order, and each line is based on a letter of the Hebrew alphabet going in order, right? It's just like if we had a poem that started with A and went to B and a line that associated with C and with D. It's very creative like this. This is a beautiful work of poetry before us. And that very first line sets up the entire passage. And my version in the English Standard Version says, an excellent wife who can find. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that is not the best way to translate that question. The better way to translate it is, a woman of valor who can find. And then I'm about, and the answer is, I'm about to show you what a woman of valor looks like. Now that word is kayil, kayil. In English, we would transliterate that over to so it's K-H-A-Y-I-L. If you're really nerding out on me right now and want to write that down, K H A. Y-I-L. If you haven't had your children yet, that may be a great word name to name your first daughter. Kayil. And so that name is a beautiful name because it doesn't mean, it can mean excellence, but the Hebrew word there is predominantly in the Old Testament. Get this, that word is predominantly used as a, as a word used for army. For military might. And that's why that first point is military might. A strong woman now, a woman is now being compared to, or an excellent wife as we see, is being compared to a person of military might. For an army. He's like, well, that doesn't sound very feminine, Pastor. That's, I just like puppy dogs, sweet things. Well, yeah, yes, that's okay. You... Uh, you uh, now, isn't it great that this is not an advertisement for the movie, but Wonder Woman is about to come out? I mean, you're welcome to the movie industry because the timing for Wonder Woman to come out in this sermon is perfect timing. The word can also mean, it can mean able. It can refer to armies, army, army. I'm reading a list of these Hebrew translations and how it is used in the Old Testament, how this specific Hebrew word is used outside of this verse 10. It talks about capability. It talks about an elite army. It talks about excellence, and that's why many of your versions have an excellent wife. But if we see that and say, man, you're an excellent wife. Teresa, you're an excellent wife. Well, yes, David, I am an excellent wife. And we think about the excellency and what that means across the board. But if you think about the word excellent, even meaning more of a military might or strength and power, it takes on different meaning. It talks about fullness, goodness, greatness, might, mighty, nobility, power, riches, strength. This is how this word is used through all of the Old Testament. Once again, it talks about troops, that word valor or valiantly. I love that word, valiantly. Very powerful. The word is used in another place in the Old Testament. is very powerful. It's used as a warrior, as wealth, wealthy and worthy. Do you hear the list? That same Hebrew word from verse 10. So what did we do? We found the nicest word possible to use. An excellent wife who can find. Now, how many of you ladies out there would much prefer it be a valiant wife, a woman of valor, of strength, of might, of power, who can find? Now, that, that is one, that'll preach right there. And you know why it preaches? Because I'm going to tell every last one of you that are a Christ-claiming, Holy Spirit-filled woman in this audience today, you are not a wimp, you are not a cream puff, but in Jesus Christ, you are strong. You are mighty, like a military might. And for those pacifists in the crowd, it's okay. This is spiritual warfare, okay? That's the way we get away with it. So, spiritual warfare, military might. There's, there's, a, there's your biblical understanding. Now, what's the cultural understanding with us? We're in a time where the models that we have for feminine strength or female strength are those who exhibit, follow me on this, that, that exhibit masculine strength. Now, I am not going to demonize one way or another because, um, I, I've, you know, whether it comes to mind like, well, are you criticizing female bodybuilders, Pastor David? Uh, chill out. 
on me, okay? My point's going to be this, is that we do have a culture that says that strong women are more like the black widow uh, from Marvel's uh, or like Wonder Woman from DC Comics. We have these movies, and we've had them for years now, where a woman of might or power is one who can fight like a man. Now, I want to, I want to be clear here. That model, I am not, I'm not taking a preacher's term, it's like condemning and saying, what I'm saying, though, is that if our models for uh, strength for women means that women need to behave like a man to then be justified as strong and powerful, that is a false image. That's a false image. And, and I would dare say, I want to take it one step further and say that you don't need that as a model. Your, pr- your worth, your strength, your might, your power does not need to be dependent upon imitating or being like a man. It's not necessary. Now, I don't, you know, I, I mix martial arts, I'm like, I am impressed. I'm like, yes, if that's your athletic choice, direction, ladies, do it. I'm impressed. Um, but when movies depict an unrealistic way of, of fighting, like you have to fight like a man, to look like a man in order to be, understand, uh, to be uh, justified, to be um, validated, I say no. There's a better picture of strength and might and power. Uh, uh, author John Stone Street writes this. He says, reflecting on women heroes from today's film, he, he was reflecting, and specifically he made a point of, of how um, he was talking about Star Wars char- feminine Star Wars characters who take on and they fight like men. So he, he leads into this with this, and so he's, that'll help us understand the very end of the quote here. He, says, uh, he said, even worse, we've become blind to the very feminine strengths that the Bible praises. You know, think of Deborah, J.L., in the book of Judges. Think of Sarah, commended twice in the New Testament for her faith, the Old Testament character, Sarah, or the Hebrews' midwives, whose courage and value for human life saved an entire generation. Think of Hannah, whose patient longing for a child ushered in the kingdom over which Jesus would reign. Think of the loyalty of Ruth, Excuse me a second. We almost had an accident on stage. Pardon the stool. Uh, Think of the loyalty of Ruth, of Mary, who at a tender age welcomed God's promise to save the world. Thank you, Bethany, for reading that prayer. This is lining right up for those attributes being being praised and thought of. And a look at history, too. Um, He writes of, he says, my colleague, Eric Metaxas, uh, who's written several books, um, and he tells of seven women in his terrific book by that name, Seven Women. And Eric Metaxas writes this, and he, he, or he, John Stone Street says, my daughter loved the chapters in Metaxas' book on Mother Teresa and Joan of Arc in particular. But when Eric wrote, the, he wrote in the introduction of the book, Eric Metaxas wrote this, when I consider the seven women I chose, I see the mo- that most of them were great for reasons that derive precisely from them their being women, not in spite of it. In other words, their accomplishments are not gender neutral, but are rooted in their singularity as women. Amen. And their lives are so much richer than the stereotyped strong female characters in today's movies, even if they weren't good with a lightsaber. And that's where he tied it back then to his um, reference to women fighting like men. And, and in order to be validated, you need to fight like a man. And so, and his point, as is mine, is that from a biblical standpoint, that's not necessary. Make no mistake, the poem of, Psalm, of Proverbs 31 is clear. Now, get this, as we read through 10 through 31, it is clear that physical strength is one of the primary attributes, but it is not claiming that a woman must be like a man, wherein like we're being like, once again, Princess Warrior Mulan, the song that they sang in that movie, the Disney movie uh, Mulan was, if only I could be like, along the lines, if only I could be like a man, and that was the, the goal during that part of, of the, uh, of the um, animated film. 
So it is not claiming that a woman must be like a man in order to be physically strong. There is a physical strength that is praised in Psalm 31 that is a different physical strength, but it is to be praised. That is the idea behind it. So it's might. A biblical standpoint, a biblical understanding is going to be that, ladies, you are strong. Ladies, you are called to courage. You are called to be courageous. That's when I see Proverbs 31.10, a woman of valor who can find, and then it goes on and answers the question. It's saying, the ideal is this. Whatever you put your hand to, whatever you face in life that is challenging, whatever tough decisions you have, whatever deep valley you walk through, oh, be a woman of courage. Be a woman of courage. God has called you to be a woman of courage. The second thing on our list there that we see, and the specific verses are in your notes there, 13 through 19 and 24 and 27. But 13 through 16 is what I want to read specifically for um, economic acumen. Economic acumen. Uh, Verses 13 through uh, 16 say, uh, the ideal woman, she uh, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of a merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and she buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Verses 24 and 25, to further give us context, say she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She mocks difficult times because she's like, I got this. She has economic acumen. She is proficient in her ability to achieve um, material wealth, um, economic growth, and sustenance. She is first shrewd. She can be shrewd in a good way, shrewd. Sometimes we hear the word shrewd and we're like, oh, that's so sinful. It's like, no, shrewd is good. It's being wise with what you have the opportunity with. I love verse 15. And we need, once again, when you read something in the Bible, and don't get the idea of what I'm about to say, don't get the idea of, well, how can we really know what it says then? It's like, but when you dive deeper into how you maybe have the translation here, and then you look at some of these words and go, wow, that is the background? That's incredible. It's so much fuller and alive than what I thought it was. And here's the beauty with verse 15. 15 once again says, she rises, so read it like, it's, like it says, it says, she rises while it is yet night. That reminds me of Teresa, by the way. She works, uh, her job, she works right now four days a week. Uh, she's up at four in the morning and she's in to her workplace by five in the morning every morning. And the thing is, she's home by about 1030 every morning. She she's, has her work day in. And, and I've seen this modeled for some of you out there as well. You rise early. In order to, you may not be up at four, but you're up early in order to be productive within your, within your life to, to, um, so I love that verse, that affirm, that's affirming. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Now we would miss this totally in the English. We see this, it's written in Hebrew originally, remember that, but that whole line of provides food for her household, it actually is, this, this is a phrase that talks about a, a, a lioness, get this, this is actually talking about using the phraseology that would be understood to be a lioness after her prey. This is a lioness on the hunt, for her prey, rises up early, hides in, the, in the, uh, the brush, and when the prey comes along, pounces out on them and eats it. 
or at least kills it, and drags it home so that her cubs may eat. Now, all this Proverbs 31 woman about being soft and gentle, and just, we're talking about a lioness, a carnivore, right? Isn't that the word? Carnivore? Canor- what's the word? There you go, carnivore. I feel like Perky the pig, where he's like stutters, and then he says a different word. <laughs> okay, so some of you got that, but... The rest of you, you missed out on a whole great set of cartoons, by the way. Um, do I hear an amen? amen. So, um, so this is actually a lioness after their prey, and the term would be used, get this, tearing it to pieces. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens is actually uh, one to go with. Now think about it. She, they use this phrase connected with economic acumen. So, uh, it, this is used with being, being uh, shrewd and going after your finances. So think about this. This is a lioness with a checkbook. Yes! This is, ladies, this is when you are saying, I'm serious about how we have a healthy finances within our household. And we are going to move forward. And we are not going to live with a mentality of poverty. But we're going to live with a, with a mentality of abundance. Because God provides, and I am going to be faithful to provide. And like a lioness, I'm going to go after this. And we're going to, I'm going to provide, I'm going to be wise with what God has given us, and then I'm going to pursue the opportunities and the open doors that God makes available. You're like, whoa, 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 pastor, hold on. What about the biblical understanding that a woman should stay home and not work, and the man should go out and be the breadwinner for the household? Pause for effect. I didn't get any fruit thrown at me. No tomatoes, rotten tomatoes, rotten eggs. Now, here's the deal. I, I, this, at this time, at this place, I am not going to stand on a stage and make a statement about whether a woman should work outside the home kind of, kind of thing. That is not the point of this sermon today. Um, and nor would I claim that anyhow. Um, but I know some feel very strongly about it and take a certain stance that it's across the board for all people, for all places, for all times. Um, I'd say we have a pretty firm argument here that, that a woman's strength is seen through the fact that she's shrewd. She's wise with finances and for taking care of those that God has given her to take care of. And I would dare say that the lioness with a checkbook includes a life of generosity. If you are not a lioness with your checkbook, then you will have no ability to be generous with those that need it the most. Whether it's your family, your friends, a need to help with injustice or poverty or difficulty, an opportunity to be wise, you are a lioness with a checkbook. Furthermore, I would say that connects, as I've alluded to already, this points to having a strong work ethic. Having a strong work ethic. There is no time to just sit around, um, to be lazy, to let someone else do it for you. The application is simply this. You are called to diligence and focus with the work that is before you, reject laziness. You are called to diligence and focus. The third area that we see in this passage is for spiritual security. And I want you to add the word, because I don't think I have it. Yeah, I put the word beside that emotional security as well. Spiritual security, and you could write in there emotional security. So verse 17 says this, She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. This calls calls you to be prepared. To be prepared because it's about this. It's the the literal term. It says she dresses herself with strength. The the King James version there, some of you love the King James. I know you do. So this is your this is your opportunity. We did all hymns today. Now we get to do King James, okay? So King James would say this. That she girds her loins with strength. 
Now, most of us wouldn't connect with what that means unless we speak King James on a regular basis or think in King James. And so, but this is, this is beautiful because you see a parallel. That terminology is, is helpful. She girds her loins with strength and she strengthens her arms. In the New King James Version. In the New King James Version of Ephesians chapter 6 now, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 says, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. You should think there's some intentional terminology used here. Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about a spiritual battle, being prepared for the spiritual battle before us, to be prepared for whatever is thrown at us. Ephesians chapter 6 is going to be talking about being prepared for that battle by having, having this, your loins girded about, being protected here, with your gird about, and you're strengthened because of that. It's using the imagery of, of what you wear and how you dress, but this is, this is a spiritual and an emotional security that you are prepared for whatever is thrown at you. Now, before we, now push pause button on that point right there, because I'm going to come back around to it, but I have to insert this right here. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 about having that spiritual armor, right? And loins girt about with truth is one of those areas. The same person, Paul, wrote in Galatians. He wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, and you're going to have part of it up here on the screen. But he says this, get this. Paul writes, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to keep reading what's between. We're going to leave that up there, but I'm going to read what's between the verses because that's verse 26. Verse 27 says, and all who have been united with Christ in the baptism have put on Christ. That all, like putting on new clothes. Okay, we got the, the, the outfit imagery going on here, right? Verse 28, up here, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you, all, you, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And verse 29, and now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. My friends, both male and female are spiritual warriors. Both are spiritual warriors. So this terminology, when we see this written in Ephesians chapter 6, that we're going to go back to in a minute, calls us to be heroic. So not only are you to be, ladies, not only are you to be prepared, be prepared by girding about your loins with strength, and also gird about your loins with truth, but there's a whole outfit that you're called to put on here in Ephesians chapter 6. And not just, and here's my point, Paul was being very clear that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Men do not have a better spiritual outfit than women. Did you hear me? Maybe you already knew that, and you're like, well, yeah, duh, pastor. We don't always live like that in the church. Choosing rank by gender. Opportunity by gender. And that's foolish talk. Because the scriptures that I read, the scriptures that we see, is the ground is level at the cross. And we all are called to be spiritual warriors. Every last one of us. No matter what gender you are. Now, I'm not talking, by now in the sermon, do I even have to justify and say, I'm not saying that we're all gender neutral? I didn't say that. Tuck that one away. There is male and female, but there's not a rank. There are differences, but there's not a lesser than. That's maybe a better way to hear it. Not a lesser, left a difference, but not a lesser than. We're all called to spiritual, be spiritual warriors, but some of us, some of you, I can't say us on this one, some of you are called to be spiritual princess warriors. Let's go let that sit for a second. Some, some of you are still processing. You're making sure the pastor is theologically correct and politically correct all at the same time. All right, so on the heroic side of things, 
we're called to be these spiritual warriors. So the call is to be heroic. The only time in the Old Testament where being heroic in this fashion is used for a female, it's used for warriors in battle and mighty men of war to be valiant, excellence, back to that word again. It's the only time in the whole Old Testament where it says, listen, you also are to be mighty. Therefore, this lauds or praises a woman's ability to provide protection, both emotionally and physically, and financial in this passage. It's speaking of finances here, uh, across the board. So, Ephesians chapter 6 then, let's read the full text of of, uh, 14 through 18 when it talks about what clothing to put on in a spiritual sense. So it says in Ephesians chapter 6, we've already read verse 14, but we'll read it again. It says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And this is mirroring Proverbs 31, uh, 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 verse 17. So, and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take that helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit and with all prayer and supplication. The application is this. Women, you are to be spiritual princess warriors. Fight the spiritual battle in prayer. Put on the full armor of God daily. Protect your mind and emotions from the lies that the world wants to speak to you and about you. You want to hear that again? I want to say it again. Some of you in your here do, do need to hear this very clearly. Because you're feeling beat. You don't feel like a spiritual princess warrior. You're feeling beat up a little bit. You're not as confident And I'm calling you to confidence. The scriptures are calling you to confidence. Women, be spiritual princess warriors. Fight the spiritual battle in prayer. Get your prayer journals out. If you don't have one, buy one. Get your pen ready. Write out all your prayer requests. Write these things out and pray. And when an answer comes through, write the answer and praise God that he provided You want to be a warrior spiritually? Keep track of God's goodness and pray about it. Bring it before his throne. Put on the full armor daily. Yes, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18 can be a prayer. God, I pray that you will give me the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, I pray for this, oh God. You can make it your prayer, but take it one step further by thinking through each of those and thinking, how can I apply these pieces of armor today and then go about applying them? Then finally, protect your mind and emotions from the lies the world wants to speak to you and about you. Do not let the world, young ladies particularly, do not let the world define what your body image should be like. Do not let the world define what it means to be a tough girl or a warrior, a princess warrior. Let Jesus define that. Let the Bible tell you what that is. And then go from there. And guess what? You, this is, will not be popular. The world, would not, the world will not ever agree with a biblical standard. And you know what? We need to be okay with that. We're told, Jesus said, the world will hate you for my name's sake. I I don't mind that at all. I'd rather them hate me for that because, you know what? My personality causes the world to hate me for other things, right? You know, I can be a knucklehead sometimes, and that's outside of Jesus. So, I don't mind if the world doesn't like me because of Jesus. The, The fourth thing is love in action. Love in action is verses 20 and 26. We see that there's a from the head and from the heart thing. So from the heart, it's about your character. Verse 20, uh, she opens up her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. 
This reflects the mind of Christ, the teachings of Christ, and the actions of Christ. The call is for you and I to be like Christ. Love must be active. Love must be active. It must be inactive in your home, first and foremost, with your friends, with your church family, and at work. Love must be active. Could you be, um, if you were arrested for being loving, would there, I, don't you love this question, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> would the judge, would the lawyer stand there and go, judge, let them go. Can you see they're not very loving? Can't you see they struggle with this part of their life, loving other people? Yeah, can't deny it. Innocent, you may go free. <laughs> Throws the gavel down. Wouldn't you love, though, say that because your life shines of love in your home, your household, with your neighbors, your friends, your church family, at work, that you're guilty. Guilty as charged. I love you. And I showed in an active way. Love must be from the heart, and it also must be from the head. This is love must be wise. This is using wisdom. And she uses wisdom. The Proverbs 31 woman uses wisdom using her mind. She, verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. There's a strong reference here to lady wisdom. Lady wisdom is throughout all of Proverbs, right? There's, there's the foolish woman who's adulterous. She's a harlot. She's, she's, uh, she sells her body. She's luring men uh, all the time. And then the contrast is from Lady Wisdom who calls and says, come on, come on. The beauty is, is that the Holy Spirit, this is, this is known in Scripture, Proverbs then is speaking, personifying the Holy Spirit as the wise woman. And so this is once again another opportunity to say that Proverbs 31 woman is saying, be more like God has called you to be and um, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. So Lady Wisdom, throughout a Proverbs, this means that we're Christ-centered and Spirit-filled, that you're called to disciple others with a strength that is special and unique to you as a woman. And once again, this is that differentiation between how God has created you uniquely and special. And that's something that you have an opportunity to disciple in the way that God has has gifted you. Um, theologian Megan DeFranza writes this about verse 26. So verse 26 that we just read there about opening up her mouth with wisdom and teaching with kindness on her tongue. That teaching and kindness with the tongue, she, um, she's a Hebrew scholar and, and theologian and she opens this up a little bit more. She says the phrase Torah kased is what it is and that means faithful instruction. It's unique uh, she said, Dr. DeFranza says, in, is unique and could refer to her mode of teaching. And that is with kindness of a mother rather than harshness of a father. Uh, teaching modeled on her generosity or a particular body of instruction, such as content of Proverbs. <clears throat> Paul reinforces this when he gives instructions to this young pastor, Titus. Who t he sends Titus to the island in the Mediterranean called Crete, and there's several Christians there that he's trying to give instruction to. <clears throat> and he says, <clears throat> excuse me, he says to Titus, Pastor Titus, he says, Titus, when you go in, I want you to do this. He says in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, specifically for women, he says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands and to the word of God, that, or, and that the word of God may not be reviled. So Paul, uh, Paul and Tim, Titus, by the way, they would have been fully aware of the content of Proverbs 31. He's not giving those instructions in a vacuum, but he, like Titus, knows Proverbs 31. And so when I say faithful teaching, in fact, Titus could have referred back in his mind and gone, wait a second, he says faithful teaching, I'm going to encourage these older women to pour into younger women and to invest them in the disciple younger women. Well, 
you know what is that reminds me of proverbs 31 when we're seen in in they didn't have verses for it he would have named the, the letter the hebrew letter he says in that one hebrew letter he says where uh, she says she opens up and teaches in kindness and she uh she teaches those that are around her that is the proverbs 31 woman is what titus may be thinking here so the application is this women of faith pour into others disciple another take another woman under your spiritual care and guidance you have no idea let me be abundantly clear ladies you have no idea the opportunity and influence that you can have and if you are one step just one step ahead of another woman you can disciple her just one step is all it takes or you can say you know what i've been there and i don't know it all but let me spend time with you and help you are you kidding? Tr- Teresa was impacted so much by when we were uh, all in our 20s, at, uh, when we were at Church and Alliance, and she would go to this mom's group, and um, it was full of these moms, and there was an older mom that every week would spend time with these moms and do a Bible study with them, but they would talk a lot about just regular life, and the children would watch in another room, and these, just, these, these little rugrats were running around the nursery all morning, and it's, but it's like... But that woman poured into these young moms, and Teresa's life was impacted greatly. What if this woman had said no? What if she did not want to invest in us? What if she says, no, I'm not adequate. No, I don't have the time. No, I have some other things going on in life. Or this? But she said yes. She said, she said yes. What is God calling you to say yes to? That in, the, in regards to discipling another, spending time with another woman and helping her grow in her walk in faith. Mothers, disciple your children. Mothers, disciple your children. Do not leave this task primarily to others to do. Similar modeling, um, of course we are a homeschool family, but we are huge proponents and believers in the public school system. We, we, it's wonderful. We're not anti-public school in any way, shape, or form. But there, the, when you have that model, there, there is a propensity saying that the schools will take care of the education of my child, so I don't have to do it at home, which there's truth to that. There's truth to that, those that have chosen that path. But that model doesn't work for spiritual development. That, that doesn't work for spiritual development. And sometimes we drop our children off at church and say, the church will disciple my child. That doesn't work the same way that it works so wonderfully in the public school system. It doesn't work with spiritual things. But when we do that, that's what happens when, we, when our, our children become adults and they start waffling because they didn't hear it from mom and dad. They just heard it from others. So I'm going to call you, mothers, disciple your children. Spend time with your children and pour into them and disciple them. We, with discipling our children... We are all homeschoolers, spiritually. Every last one of us, when it comes to our old children. Older women, mentor and train. This only happens through time spent. We are rich at Orange Friends Church with older women who are spiritually mature and developed, can, can pour into others. But we're underutilized in this gold mine. That's a pastoral perspective. So I'm going to call you to this. Older women, what, whatever category you want to throw yourself in, by the way. So that could be 20 and up or whatever. Find someone that you can pour into spiritually. If you can't figure it out, if you don't, it's like, what do I do? I'm going to offer a class here, and when I come back from vacation, for four weeks in June, I'm going to teach people how to disciple other people. Come to my class. And I'll teach you, or we'll find other ways of doing it. All women model love in action. The final piece is rewarding reputation. This uh, Proverbs 31 woman has rewarding reputation. Verses 23 and then 28 through 31, that's the big climax. It builds to the end, and, you know, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's the one we love to quote, and it is a wonderful verse. But there's a rewarding reputation when, we, when, when ladies, you live out a life of a Proverbs 31 woman, this model that's here, or this, this um, mighty warrior uh, uh, 
path. And that is a, a reputation with husband and children. So her husband rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. In verse 23, her husband is known at the city gates when the sit, sit, sit among the elders of the land. And, just, and so in other words, the one, she has a great reputation, so he has a great reputation. Can you imagine them sit around the city gates and go, man, your wife, what a woman. But they meet it in a spiritual sense. Come on, slow your roll. But yeah, the reputation of your wife, she's something. She's incredible. It's like the time that I went to a youth camp. Can I tell you this story? It's a funny one. I went to youth camp. When Teresa and I were first married, we went to a youth camp. And we were sitting around a table, me and a bunch of guys. And she was working the camp too. And a guy leaned over to me. And Teresa was walking across the, caf- uh, the cafeteria at this camp. And she says, man, this guy had no idea who my wife was. And she says, man, will you look at that tall drink of water? <laughs> How would you handle that? Some of you were like, oh, they're fighting words. Come on. I are like... I said, thank you, that's my wife. He was like, red, like, uh. I, she gave me a good reputation. She's, she's a beautiful woman. Did you get that? Record that? <laughs> Teresa, did you hear it as you listened back to the sermon? Okay, so, but spiritually, I, I'll tell you, I believe Teresa also is what a woman spiritually. That reputation and so, um, and then the next thing is that a victorious reputation with friends, neighbors, and community. Proverbs 31, 29 through 30, many women have done excellently, which we prefer than the translation that says, many daughters have done valiantly, but you suppress, suppress them all. There are many mighty, mighty warriors, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works Praise her in the gates. You have a victorious reputation. I would tag on to this that you are a conqueror. Romans 8, 37 through 39, and you're going to have just uh, verse 37 here. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. You are a conqueror. When I read these verses of... um, Many women have done excellently or valiantly. They said, but you surpass them all. That you surpass them all is this, you are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You surpass them all because of what Jesus has done for you. Through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. New Living Translation says it this way. I know what it is to live on almost nothing and know how it is to live on everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is a full stomach or an empty stomach, with plenty or little. Now, I read verse 12 there. I'm going to read 13 in a second. But many of you ladies here, you can relate to that right there, right? There have been tough times in your life, especially those that are seasoned in here that I talked about earlier that that younger ladies can look up to and say, tell me, how how was it when you were first married and lived on beans and rice? We lived on macaroni and cheese. It was tough. But you know what? I know what it's like. And this is you ladies, right? How many ladies in here can relate to this? When we were first married or when we were younger, I know what it's like to be hungry. And then you know what? We've had some really good times. I know what it's like to have a lot. I know what it's like to to sit with your child in a hospital and wonder if they're going to make it. I know what it's like to go through a dark time of depression. I know what it's like to lose a parent or a friend. I also know what it's like to kind of win life's lottery, that things are going really well. I know what it's like to have a wonderful, growing marriage. I know what it's like to go through just a bitter divorce. That's what I hear Paul saying in verse 12, these ups and downs. But verse 13 is that key. You are a conqueror because for I can do all these things, I can do everything, ups and downs and everything through Christ 
who gives me strength. Because you are a conqueror. You are victorious. And that leads to a rewarding reputation. So finally, I'll just say this. My encouragement to all of you, all the ladies in the room, all the women in the room, to our daughters, to my daughter, and all of our daughters is this. You may not be perfect. This was not a sermon about being perfect. Do not hear that at all. But you are a strong woman of God. You are a spiritual warrior princess. A Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-filled disciple of Jesus. You are a woman of strength. Will you pray with me? God, I pray um, specifically for every uh, woman in the room that you will lay your hand upon them and the point of this Proverbs 31 sermon that connects most with them, the specific area that they needed emboldened, they needed life spoken into them, they needed strength, they needed reminded, they needed affirmed, that specific area, I pray even now that you will build them up Fill them. I pray, oh God, that you, every woman in here, that you will touch them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Can I ask a huge, huge thing? If, especially if you're related to them, please. Will you just reach, some of you are already doing this, but can you reach out and just touch the woman in your life, lay your hand on them, and I'm going to just pray a blessing. And ladies, you can do this as well. But husbands, touch your wives, t- 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 fathers, daughters, um, t- whatever it may be. If, you, if, if someone else is beside you, a good friend, t- just reach out. Could you touch someone? We're going to pray a blessing on the women in this room. I pray a blessing even now on every woman in this room. Once again, God, from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, that you will give them prosperity and life, that you will create in them and build up with them to be spiritual princess warriors, to not be afraid to be feminine, not feel like they need to be a man to be strong, but God, be confident that you have made them strong, physically, spiritually, emotionally, uniquely how you have created them. Lay this blessing upon them. We pray that there may be disciplers raised up in our midst, influencers. And God, we give you honor and glory and praise for those that are even in our midst that walk through this modeling day by day. They are in our church family and they are women who lead the way in being mighty warriors for you. We thank you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray this. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there. And um, and, hey, guys, let's bless them today. Just bless them. Whatever that means um, for us in our house, it means mama doesn't have to do anything around the house. That's one of the things on the list. And so just what does it mean to, and then lots of chocolate, you know. But that may not be the blessing for, your, for, for the, the woman in your life, but be a blessing too and, and bless your, the mother in your life today. Go with God and be at peace. You've been listening to Dr. David Mabry, lead pastor at Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. Do you have a question or a comment for Pastor David? Would you like to share your story or how Pastor David's messages have helped you in your journey with the Lord? We would love to hear from you. Please email us at transformed at orangefriendschurch.org. Join us next week for another relevant, Christ-centered message. This podcast is a production of Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. For more information, please visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. Thank you and have a wonderful week.